give us a sense, uh, your sense of where the disease is in your state, and what do you need to see between now and May 20 to relieve at least some of those restrictions? Uh, David, nice to be with you. Um, look, Connecticut got pretty hard. We were right next to uh, New York City, which was uh, in many ways the Wuhan province of the pandemic here in the United States. And, um, but now it's, uh, you know, six weeks later, uh, all those curves are bending in the right direction. We have uh, extra uh, hospitalization capacity there, which was a key metric. We're finally getting the PPE. We delivered it ourselves, bought it from China. Complicated process, I might say. We got track and trace and testing ready to go. And these are the key metrics we needed to give people confidence we could begin to reopen on May 20th. Uh, Governor, can you give us any sense of the distribution across the state? And I mean, I guess, both socioeconomic but also geographic. We see some differences in some states. In fact, of course, New York is a larger ge geographic state. There's going to be differences in the reopening. Is that going to apply in Connecticut? Well, first of all, um, we were hit in different ways in different regions. You know, Fairfield County, which is closest to New York City, was hit the hardest, hit the earliest. Went right down Metro North and I-95 up through Bridgeport, New Haven, Hartford. That was the area that probably uh, got hit the hardest uh, because of the proximity to New York. And now we've got Eastern Connecticut, which is the New London area, and maybe a little bit of Boston is coming down that way as well. Uh, but we're a pretty small state, so our anticipation is we're going to open on a statewide basis uh, on a very thoughtful way. And uh, on some things, we want to do it in association with our neighboring governors. It doesn't do me any good to um, close down bars and restaurants if Andrew Cuomo opens them up in Westchester County. So we're doing some things in conjunction. Yeah, Governor, as you mentioned, there's so much integration between Connecticut and particularly New York City, the New York City area. What about those commuter trains? Will that pose a particular challenge for you? Because we have a lot of people going back and forth between Connecticut and New York every single day on those trains. Uh, there were a lot of people uh, going back and forth, uh, and we thought about that. But within a, a few weeks, ridership was down 95 percent. So I think people uh, voted with their feet, so to speak. They started staying at home, they started telecommuting, or they drove if they had to, which was a good thing. So um, Governor Cuomo and I thought about what we should do with, say, Metro North, the rail system, and decided it was probably first responders and people that really had no other way to get to work. So we did keep it open on a limited basis. But as you reopen, as, as we reopen, will we be looking at a certain curtailment, for example, a capacity, the, the seating arrangements, things like that, in the commuter trains? Uh, we're certainly going to be very strict about um, uh, desanitizing and making sure everything is clean on a real basis. Probably going to discourage people from going in the train for the near term. Uh, probably going to uh, strongly recommend that everybody use masks in the train for the near term. But I think even bigger, I think you're going to find that um, the, the old idea of a commuter going into New York City five days a week may be an idea that's behind us. I think we found at the end of this uh, COVID uh, session um, that we're realizing that telecommuting in many cases works. So maybe you have a great job that seems to be a geographically located in New York City. You can do it two thirds of the time from your uh, home in Stanford. As you look toward a possible reopening, uh, uh, what is your situation with respect to testing, with respect to tracing, and hospital capacity? You said you have the hospital capacity you need right now, but in case there's a flare-up, how much capacity do you have to deal with it? Well, we have 40 percent capacity now, and um, I think uh, that, that's a pretty good benchmark. If there's a flare-up, I would rethink things if we got to 80 or 90 percent capacity. Obviously, we have capacity now. In fact, they're going back and doing some of the uh, so-called electives, many of which were important operations that were put off and should be uh, taking place now. The testing, um, we've ramped that up. We're doubled it from last week. We'll double it again next week. So we'll be doing about 42,000 tests a week uh, starting next week. Governor, you mentioned that PPE, that personal protective equipment that you bought from China, a fair amount of it now. Have you had any issues with the quality of that? Because there have been some other places around the world and even around the country who bought things from China, and it turns out it didn't work so well, whether it's testing kits or whether it's PPE. We had to be very careful in, in how you vet this. That's, that's a good question. 
And uh, let's face it, you know, a, a month or so ago when people were really scrambling the globe, uh, everybody had a friend who had a cousin in Ukraine who did some work with Rudy Giuliani, and you didn't know where you were getting this uh, stuff from. Uh, we didn't do any of that, but we found this. We vetted it very carefully, working closely with the government of, of China, working with some strong relationships we had here with the business people in Connecticut. So I have it on high confidence that this is the right stuff. Uh, going forward, I mean, you've been coordinating with Governor Cuomo, with Governor Murphy down in New Jersey and things like that. Do you envision a world in which those three states and maybe more really get together in the manufacturing and purchasing of PPE and stockpiling? Yeah, I think that makes all the sense in the world. You know, we've got a buying consortium now, so it's not little Connecticut going all the way to China to buy this product. But even more importantly, we ought to figure out who is good at manufacturing what? We, we've got a facility here in this state that makes vents. Gina Raimondo up in Rhode Island you know, has a group that's making uh, masks in a significant way. Phil Murphy, they've got some of the best pharma in the country and are doing the saliva tests. So I think there are a lot of ways we can mix and match. So, so, Governor, you made a big change in your administration yesterday. You're public health commissioner. Uh, you're stepping aside, and you're in the process. You have an interim. You're in this process of putting somebody new in. I'm not going to ask about why you made that change. Everybody else has asked you the question. But it was said, including by your former public health commissioner, that you wanted to go a different direction. What is the different direction you want to go? Uh, state government works in silos. People aren't always talking to each other. We found actually the hospital system didn't coordinate with the, each other as well. Uh, so I really worked hard to make sure I worked on a regional basis with my governors, get the hospital system, the academics involved as we reopened Connecticut. And when it came to health care within the state government, I thought it made sense to have the Department of Social Services and public health more closely aligned. You know, one regulates the nursing home, one does the rates on the nursing homes. So we're trying to get better coordination. At the same time, obviously, this is a critical point for Connecticut. Are you confident you can make this transition to starting to open up some and gradually opening up more and not miss a beat with the change at the top of the Public Health Administration? No, we're not going to miss a beat there. We're going to be uh, operating, uh, you know, fully and on a coordinated basis. But you're right. I mean, this pandemic changes every day. Uh, the facts on the ground, it's highly infectious. And I look around the world, I look around uh, the regions where I see uh, flare-ups going on. So that's why I'm being very cautious about um, making sure we meet the metrics and knowing when we have to throttle back if there is a flare-up. Uh, Governor, give us a sense of what the fiscal effect has been thus far on the state of Connecticut. We certainly hear a lot from governors, Republican and Democrat, I will say, that they really need some help from the federal government. We have a Democratic proposal now out of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, with a billion dollars split between state and local. What are Connecticut's needs? Well, it's tough. I think we're in um, relatively good shape compared to our peers, but that's not uh, a great metric. Um, you know, we are a big manufacturing state. We never closed down manufacturing. We're doing a lot of construction. That's ramping up. We had a $2.5 billion rainy day fund, which for a small state like us is, um, you know, close to 15% of our budget. So I think we're relatively okay for now. But um, let's face it, if I've got a billion dollar deficit in this fiscal year, 90% of it is related to the fact that we um, are losing income tax and sales tax, it's related to the fact that the revenues have just uh, collapsed at this point. And that's very pronounced in all my neighboring states as well. So I do, do think that the uh, federal government should step in with some support because this is no time to have the state governments uh, slashing spending and raising taxes. That's a lousy alternative. What we've heard from Republicans, uh, and I wonder if you don't think they have at least something of a point, is there's a difference among the states. Some have been more prudent, some have been less prudent, and it's not quite proper to bail out the people who are having problems in part because they've put too much, for example, up in pensions. Are you sympathetic at all to that, an that argument? Uh, not really. I mean, Mitch McConnell made that argument, and Kentucky has one of the worst funded pensions in the country, so physician, heal thyself. You know, there are some states that are energy dependent. Take Texas, take Wyoming, take North Dakota. You know, they've been hit hard because they make a lot of their revenues off of uh, energy tax, which is obviously down. Other states are uh, drastically impacted by tourism. I look at Florida, for example. So 
Every state, blue and red, has been impacted in one way or another by this COVID crisis, directly or indirectly. So I wouldn't turn this into a political thing. I'd try and figure out what is the policy that helps these states get back on our feet and the economy get back on its feet. It's the states getting back on their feet, but it's also particular households getting back on their feet. And, and I was struck, as I think others were today, by Fed Chair Jay Powell's testimony, in which he said 40 percent of households making less than $40,000 a year are now out of work. What's the situation in Connecticut? What do we need to go do going forward once we get past the next two, three, six months? What do we need for those people going forward? Yeah, I found in Connecticut that um, we kept um, businesses that represent over 70 percent of our GDP operating. That's mentioned manufacturing, finance, for example. But um, the service sector, uh, restaurants, bars, salons, that's where a lot of the employment is. Those folks earning $40,000 a year left, that was hit hard. That's where 50 percent of our unemployment is. They represent 15 percent of the GDP, 50 percent of the unemployment. So. We're cautiously trying to get them back to work. And in the meantime, we help them get um, access to PPP loans, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. And the Connecticut did pretty well there, but that's a short-term bridge. You have such a good sense of the people of Connecticut. Do you think that they'll be willing to come back out and go to restaurants and things like that? Because it's not just a question of whether they're open, it's also a question of whether we all feel safe enough to go participate in commerce. Well, it's not going to be like the end of Prohibition where they say go out and get a beer and everybody jams into the speakeasies, and nor do we want it to be that way. I think the consumer is going to be cautious. You know, restaurants, you start with outside dining only. And I think people may walk by a couple times. They'll see whether uh, the waiters are wearing a mask. They'll see whether the tables are six feet apart. They'll see whether um, the basic protocols are being followed and maybe a week or so later, they may be willing to take a look in there. And then once you see your neighbor in there, maybe a couple weeks later, you're willing to go there. And that's not all bad, by the way. I, I salute that caution, and it gives us time to measure how we slowly reopen. Uh, Governor, is it too soon to ask the question, what good might conceivably come out of this? Because typically in a true crisis, something good comes out of it. Can you see something for Connecticut? Yeah, some things will, will change forever. Uh, as I suggested before, I think telecommuting has taught us a lot about um, the workplace. Uh, I was on with the uh, 12 biggest CEOs in the state, and unanimously they said, we're going to probably shrink our footprint by uh, 20 or 30 percent, our physical footprint, not people, physical footprint in terms of real estate. You know, I think uh, when we see our schools uh, going forward, we're figuring out whether our colleges open in the fall or how they open in the fall. I think you'll see a hybrid of... Uh, you know, tele-learning and in-classroom learning. Uh, we really need to reform health care uh, in many different ways. And I think telehealth just got a real shot in the arm. We figured out how we can more economically serve more people in a safer way. And I think we're going to rethink nursing homes.